Who was Sariputta? Well, he was probably the Buddha's most famous disciple, but we want to get into that a bit in today's video. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. On today's video, I want to discuss Sariputta, who is, as I say, perhaps the Buddha's most famous disciple. He was uh, the disciple who was known as foremost in wisdom. And as such, he was sort of the lead disciple insofar as there were, insofar as there was one. And what we want to do in today's video is to go into a bit of his life. Now, there's a lot to discuss, and so what I'm going to try to do is to pare this video down to the most important highlights, or some of the most important highlights anyway. Uh, we'll try to, at the beginning, uh, point out his beginnings with the Sangha sort of where he where his ideas seem to have come from because we do have clues i think from the early texts about sort of what made him tick as a person and then in the middle portion here or uh, second portion i should say we'll look at his role in the sangha sort of what role he played in uh, the development of the dharma insofar as we can tell from the early texts and then last, we're going to turn to developments that happened with him after he died. Because in, in many ways, some of the most famous developments about Sariputta happened indeed after his death. We'll begin with Sariputta's early development. Sariputta was born as a man named Upatissa. Upatissa was his given name. And when we first meet Upatissa in the early uh, texts, uh, he is a follower of a different leader, a different guru, a man named, named Sanjaya, Sanjaya the Wanderer. This is almost certainly a man named Sanjaya Balatiputta, who we know uh, because the Buddha actually discusses Sanjaya Balatiputta's uh, views in several texts. I have a video about Sanjaya and other uh, competitors of the Buddha at the time. I'll put a link to that video down below in case you want to know more. But basically, Sanjaya Balatiputta seems to have been somebody who was uh, what we might call an arch-skeptic, somebody who was not willing to come out with any positive views of his own, who may have been something of an argumentative sophist, uh, that is to say, somebody who delighted in perhaps cutting down the, the views of other people, uh, showing how the views of other people were not able to be established, but who was not willing to establish his own viewpoints, was not, was not willing to come out with his own uh, positive beliefs, perhaps because he believed that they could all be, in some sense, demolished. Um, now, all of this is, to a certain extent, uh, a question, because we don't know a whole lot about Sanjaya's views, but at least it makes some sense in the sense that uh, Upatissa, the man who would become Sariputta, seems to have been a, a, a very deep intellectual, and many intellectuals are indeed taken in by these kinds of, of viewpoints of uh, argument, arguing and uh, skepticism, uh, seeing how they can argue with other people and overcome them. And the Buddha indeed termed Sanjaya Balatiputta an eel wriggler, he wriggled like an eel. He was able to get out of, of having to make any positive claims at all. The Buddha obviously did not like that, and his, his name of eel wriggler for Sanjaya was is intended to be a, a kind of a put-down. Now, at the time, uh, Upatissa was in the company of his good friend Kolita, who would later become known as Moggallana. The two, Sariputta and Moggallana, are the two Buddha's chief disciples, or would become the Buddha's chief disciples. But in any event, at this time, before they've even met the Buddha, they're here with, with Sanjaya, and seem, both of them seem to be somewhat disappointed. That is to say, they've gotten as far as they can get with Sanjaya, it seems like, and yet neither of them really feels that they have, uh, not only have not achieved anything like enlightenment, but that they are not really clearly on the road to anything like enlightenment. So they both seem somewhat uh, at loose ends. And they've made a pact that they're going to tell each other if they find the road to enlightenment. And at one day, 
uh, Upatisa says that he he's runs across somebody, a, a person, a, a, a follower of a different guru, a different teacher, a man named Asaji, who seems to have a very clear and pure countenance. That is to say, he seems to be very serene and calm, which is what Upatisa is looking for. And Upatisa is very struck by this person and asks him who his guru is, who he's studying under. And Asaji says that he's studying under the, the Buddha. Uh, and Upatisa asks, what does the Buddha teach? And here, Asaji, Asaji doesn't want to give an enormous discourse, uh, first of all, because although he is himself at this point enlightened, he isn't, uh, it seems, a great scholar, perhaps, and so he may not have a scholarly kind of understanding of all the Dharma. Also, I don't think he necessarily wants to go into a long discussion in front of somebody who may be a skeptic, you know, who may try to uh, tear all of it down. He may think that that's sort of not a very good way to spend his time. So in any event, Asaji says, I'm not going to give you a long discourse, I can't give you a long discourse, but I can give you a short synopsis of the Dharma. And is very interested in that. And so Asaji gives one of the most famous short synopses of the Dharma that we find in early Buddhism. What he says is that his teacher, the Buddha, uh, gives this teaching that of those things that arise from a cause, the Tathagata has told the cause, the Tathagata being the Buddha, and also what their cessation is. This is the doctrine of the great recluse. Now this short passage here seems to distill the Dharma down into an example of causation, of ca that everything comes up due to a cause and, and falls away due to a cause. And for whatever reason, that partic this particular description made something click in Upatisa's mind, and he, it's said, gained a glimpse of enlightenment. He gained a glimpse of nirvana. He, he attained what in the later tradition will be called stream entry. That is to say, he doesn't become himself enlightened at this point, but at least he begins to understand that there is a road to enlightenment that he now can follow. And so Upatisa and indeed later Moggallana as well, or I should say Kolita as well, decide to become, to decide to leave Sanjaya and become disciples of the Buddha. And at this point they change their names. Uh, Upatisa becomes uh, Sariputta, which means son of Sari. I believe Sari was his mother's name. And uh, Kolita becomes Moggallana. And so both of them then undertake uh, the, the Dharma, the, the practice of the Buddha. Now, having become a disciple of the Buddha, Sariputta's enlightenment then, his enlightenment experience then, is actually uh, quite interesting because in, in some ways it sort of follows or mirrors or deepens, shall we say, uh, the experience we've already seen. Uh, it's said to have occurred two weeks later in some documents, some early documents, it says that this uh, enlightenment experience happened two weeks after he became a, a monastic under the Buddha. It's said that he, uh, Sariputta, is fanning the Buddha at, at one point, and the Buddha undertakes a discussion with uh, a potential uh, uh, follower of his, a man named Diganaka. Now, in some texts, it's said that Diganaka is actually a relative of Sariputta, which is quite possible given his beliefs. Uh, Diganaka has a belief that that he expresses by saying, uh, this is my doctrine and view, I believe nothing. And of course, this view will remind us of Sanjaya Balatiputta's view that I've just described, uh, uh, this eel wriggling of, of not willing to accept any positive kind of claim. So it may very well be that Diganaka is as well a, a follower of Sanjaya, or at least somebody who believes the same things as Sanjaya. In any event, the Buddha, when he hears this, uh, seems to have thought it rather funny because he responds uh, by putting Diganaka into a kind of a bind. Diganaka, I should say the Buddha says, 
Well, Diganica, uh, this view of yours, do you believe it? That is to say, by saying that you have a view that you believe nothing, uh, the question is, well, do you believe that? Do you believe that you believe nothing? Uh, if you do, then uh, you're contradicting yourself. And if you don't, uh, then uh, what is it that you uh, are asserting here? Uh, it's not clear that you're asserting anything. Diganica doesn't really have uh, much of a response there. He basically says he doesn't care. But the point is that in a very, very short uh, back and forth, the Buddha has basically poked a hole in this kind of extreme skeptical uh, stance. And having caught Diganaka in this kind of trap, the Buddha then goes on to describe his own approach to views. Uh, basically, he says that whether you profess to believe everything, or profess to believe nothing, or profess to believe some things and not others, in all of these circumstances, you can get yourself into, into problems. And the problems are dispute, argument, uh, conflict with other people. And that is the issue. That is the real problem here, is argument, dispute, conflict, hatred, the kinds of things that uh, make us unhappy, that, that create strife and damage in the world, danger in the world. And so what the Buddha says, basically, is that the, the problem isn't so much having beliefs or not having beliefs, but rather the attitude that we take to those beliefs. That is, do we cling to them? Do we hold to them with a kind of passion that tends to promote argument? Or, alternately, do we cling to our lack of beliefs with passion that tends to promote argument and dispute? So, what the Buddha does here is to skillfully change the discussion from one of whether we have beliefs or not to how we approach beliefs. And the Buddha ends his discourse with Diganaka basically by saying that one who is properly enlightened doesn't side with anyone or fight with anyone. They speak the language of the world without misapprehending it. That is, they understand the, un the, the beliefs and the language of beliefs, beliefs after all the kinds of things that we can discuss with language. They use this language, language of beliefs, without clinging to it. In other words, they'll assert a belief and they won't cling to that belief. Or they'll assert a lack of a belief without clinging to that lack of a belief. It's a, an emotional standing back from the, the quality of our beliefs uh, so that we don't uh, involve ourselves in arguments, disputes, conflict. And it's said that after hearing this discussion between the Buddha and Diganaka, Sariputta became enlightened. Now, the exact way that that happened is something of a question, because it's described different ways in different texts. That is to say, how exactly, what exactly happened in Sariputta's mind. Uh, in one of these texts, the one that I've been discussing here, uh, the, the step to enlightenment seems to be quite immediate. That is to say that he became enlightened while he was listening to this discussion. There are other uh, versions of this, in the Chinese in particular, in which he went into, a medita went into meditation afterwards, or it seems to have been afterwards, and became enlightened during that meditation. There's one uh, quite famous early text in the Majjhima Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya 111, which discusses uh, Sariputta's enlightenment in terms of enormous number of different uh, meditations and his skill at them and so on. However, that text doesn't have any uh, known parallels and appears to be uh, quite late. It seems to be influenced by the Abhidharma and so probably is not a text from that time period. Uh, so, in any event, there are questions now uh, as to how this actually happened. I think one interesting other clue, however, is that there is a poem among the poems of the early uh, monastic monks, uh, where, which purports to be the poem that Sariputta himself composed that discusses, among other things, his enlightenment experience. And in that poem, he simply says that he became enlightened after listening or while listening to this discourse that the Buddha had with 
a follower, a potential follower. And then I think it's interesting to add that Sariputta goes on to say that he had no particular interest in uh, the what are called five sort of supernatural knowledges that came after that enlightenment, or just before it at any rate, around the time of it. Uh, traditionally, it's said that when you attain enlightenment, you gain certain kinds of supernatural abilities, such as the ability to see past lives, or the ability to have uh, uh, extreme hearing or seeing, so that you can see or hear things that are not near you. Uh, that you're able to see the karmic consequences of people's actions. It's interesting that Sariputta, who is perhaps the most uh, wise and uh, insightful of the Buddha's disciples, wasn't interested in these, and from that context, from that uh, poem, perhaps didn't even feel that he had achieved them. Uh, he had achieved enlightenment on its own without any of these other uh, concomitant apparent abilities, claimed abilities. Now second, I want to turn to Sariputta's role in the Sangha, what role he played as an active monastic in the Sangha. Now I think what, I've, what we've established here with uh, his early career is his depth of interest in views, in right view, in the Dharma in particular. That seems to have been his motivation, his, his, his central motivation in, in the rest of his career. And uh, as a result, it's not surprising that many of the, or some of, I should say, the most central uh, discourses about the Dharma are spoken by Sariputta himself. In particular, uh, one early sutta, which is the sutta on right view, a right view being the first stage in the Eightfold Path. Uh, the Sutta on Right View actually is spoken by Sariputta. And in that uh, discourse, uh, Sariputta discusses, uh, to begin with, uh, the skillful and the unskillful, which is, we might say, the basis of Right View, the very origin of Right View. Without being able to make a distinction between skillful and unskillful, we have no opportunity to really uh, delve into Right View. And then from there, uh, Sariputta discusses the Four Noble Truths, uh, perhaps the foundational uh, item of Dharma in all of Buddhism. And from there, he discusses uh, dependent origination, another very, we might say, abstruse, complex kind of uh, Buddhist understanding of causation. And I've done a video about uh, the de dependent origination. I'll put a link to that one also in, in the show notes below in case you want to know more. So in any event, this is a lengthy sutta where Sariputta goes through all of these different aspects of right view. And we may e indeed even wonder to what extent uh, Sariputta may have been instrumental in the development of the concept of right view, or in perhaps the development of some of these subconcepts, such as the Four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path. If he was, that development is lost to us because it's not discussed in the early suttas. In the early suttas, these are discussed uh, pretty much solely as the discoveries of the Buddha himself. But we can wonder to what extent perhaps Sariputta uh, may have refined these concepts or may have been even instrumental in developing them. In Sariputta's later life in the Sangha, he seems to have worked very diligently to keep the Dharma from being dissipated and forgotten. Uh, one key event was the death of a man named Nigantha Nataputta, who uh, was the leader of the Jain community. The Jains were a, uh, a, compet a comp competing, com I should say, competing sect at the time in India. They still are around nowadays. They had slightly different ideas. Uh, they had been around before the Buddha's lifetime. Uh, but when Nigantha Nataputta passed away, it is said, uh, the, the Jains fell into argument and dispute among themselves as to what the correct teaching was. And there was at the time, or appeared to be at the time, a real possibility that Jainism would simply cease to exist because of the extent of disagreement among uh, the followers of Nigantha Nataputta. And Sariputta seems to have seen this, or he discusses having seen this, and saying to the disciples, basically, that this is what happens when the Dharma is not well discussed and explained. 
That is to say, when people when when the Dharma is not discussed in a in a very structured way, everyone get, begins to get their own idea, and then you have disputes and arguments and differences of opinion about the Dharma. And when the Dharma isn't properly explained, people misunderstand it, and the same thing can happen. And so this is what led him, or seems to have led him, to try to organize the Dharma in ways that made it easier to comprehend, easier to memorize, and easier to pass down. So in particular, organizing the Dharma into, uh, into numbers, so the, all of the ones are put together, and then all of the twos. We can think of things like the Four, uh, the four Noble Truths or the Eightfold Path. There are many, many, many of these numbered lists in, that, we come, that come from early Buddhism. Some of this may have originated with Sariputta himself, who wanted to, who felt that it's by numbering things in a list that we're going to remember them. Uh, first, they're easier to memorize. Also, we know that, you know, if we have something called the Eightfold Path, and we can only remember six of them, that we've, we know that we've, la we've left off two. Whereas if you simply try to memorize each independently without knowing that it's supposed to be eight, you can, you can end up with six without realizing that you have forgotten something. So numbering uh, makes a lot of sense when it comes to memorization. We have to remember that none, nothing was written down in the day of the Buddha. It was all memorized. There, there doesn't seem to have been uh, any written language at the time. Uh, the written language came about a century or so later, more or less. Um, so in any event, in an early text called the Sangiti Sutta, the Sutta of Chanting Together, Sariputta leads the monastics in a chant, which appears to have been one of many, many such chants, where they chant the Dharma together so as to be able to uh, keep a check on one another. They're all saying the same thing, so they're all on the same page. They're all memorizing these lists of numbers, so that they all know uh, sort of the, the, the basic building blocks of the Dharma. And I would argue that it's uh, pretty clearly Sariputta's lifelong interest in the role of views, of beliefs, that led him to that place. Uh, that is, he, he went from a position of extreme skepticism, perhaps, following Sanjaya, of not believing anything, to, begin, to understanding that the problem isn't about believing or having views, but rather about how we uh, attach to them or don't attach ourselves to them, that, that's the real issue. And in later, uh, I should say later on, uh, Sariputta's advancements on these fronts, his organization of the Dharma into categories and numbers and lists, eventually developed into what became known as the Abhidharma or Abhidhamma in Pali. And the Abhidhamma is uh, basically a, a very large corpus of information that is intended to systematize the teaching that we find unsystematically in the discourses. Uh, in the discourses, it's difficult to really understand where we are with the Dharma because the, each discourse is about something different and they're not very well organized. The Abhidhamma intends to organize things. And that seems to have begun with Sariputta, and so Sariputta became known as the father of the Abhidharma, although the Abhidharma really didn't develop in full until well after his lifetime. And indeed, eventually, Sariputta did predecease the Buddha. He died before the Buddha died. Now, third, I would like to discuss some of the developments, only some of them, of course, there are many, but some of the key and interesting developments with Sariputta after he passed away. After he passed away, of course, the Abhidharma, I shouldn't say of course, but the Abhidharma became more and more important for several centuries. Its development itself was of extreme importance. And it became, in certain circles, at least as important as the suttas themselves, and perhaps even more important, because it was a distillation of the Dharma. It was the distilled purity of what the Buddha had said, and again, Sariputta was, uh, was held to be the father of this development, of this Abhidharma. However, with time also, the Abhidharma be began to be viewed as somewhat ossified, as somewhat 
old-fashioned, as somewhat stuck in its ways, as scholastic in the sense of being difficult to understand and abstruse and the sort of thing that really only was of interest to sort of intellectual geeks and not to a lot of people who are actually practicing Buddhism. And so uh, the Abhidharma went through a period of great flourishing and then through a period where it was very much out of fashion. And during this period of the out of fashion of the Abhidharma, there became flourishing of a number of very important new ideas in Buddhism. And this was around the turn of the Common Era. That is to say, first century BC or BCE, first century of the Common Era. Uh, and at that point, Sariputta became something of a foil to this new development. These new thinkers composed new sutras, new works describing their own viewpoint, which would eventually become known as the Mahayana. And in several of them, Sariputta, as I say, serves as something of a foil. So, for example, we have the uh, Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, which is a sutra which was composed sometime around the first century of the Common Era, in which uh, Sariputra, uh, Sariputta, or Shariputra as he's known in, in Sanskrit, these are written in Sanskrit, that comes across as somebody who is really quite ignorant. He is stuck in the old, the old ways. He's, being, he's been left behind. He needs to be he, he needs to be instructed in this new dharma, in this new interpretation of the Buddha's teaching, uh, because he himself is out of touch. He's stuck in the Abhidharma way of thinking of things, and that's been bypassed. That is old-fashioned. That's out of fashion right now. Shariputra is also somebody who is, is described as sort of clinging to rules and rituals, these kind of ossified rules and rituals from the past, which are no longer useful anymore. Now, and also in other sutras, the so-called Prajnaparamita sutras, that is the perfection of wisdom sutras, uh, again, Sariputra is often uh, depicted as somebody who is ignorant, who needs teaching, who does not understand the essential emptiness of all phenomena, who clings to the categories of the Abhidharma and isn't willing to leave them behind. And perhaps most famously in the Heart Sutra, which is one of the, again, the most famous uh, sutras in all of Mahayana Buddhism, the Heart Sutra is set up as a discussion between Avalokiteshvara, who was the Bodhisattva of Compassion in the Mahayana, and the, this Bodhisattva of Compassion is teaching Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, to Sariputta. And many of us may therefore miss the subtext here. Uh, the subtext is that Sariputta is somebody who is known, or was known at any rate, as the wisest of all of the Buddha's disciples. And to have this uh, person who is typified by wisdom as, again, the wisest of the Buddha's disciples, the wisest apart from the Buddha himself, uh, somebody who the Buddha said was basically as wise as anyone, to have him to be in a position of learning wisdom from a Mahayana Bodhisattva is, I think, pretty clearly a polemical sutra. And I think many of us may miss that polemicism when we read it nowadays. We simply see it as a discussion between two people, Sariputra and, and Avalokiteshvara. But it's not just the, any two people. It's two people that are set up trying to get across a particular message. That is, that it's this new uh, development of the Mahayana which is superior to what went before, at least in, under the interpretation of somebody like Sariputra, who was uh, known for the Abhidharma, that this is so important and so new and so advanced that even the best of the people from before, the wisest, need to be taught by someone. And so this setup highlights these huge changes, again, using Sariputta as a kind of foil. I've done a, a longer video about the history of the Mahayana where I go into more of this from within the, a context of the development of that school of Buddhism. And I'll put a link to that video up here on the screen if you haven't seen it. 
Thanks so much to all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you're getting something out of these videos, take a look over there and see if there's something you wouldn't mind joining us about, because we're doing a lot of interesting stuff over there. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next one. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.